What's happening? Got it, we good? Hello. Are we set up or what? Hello. We're waiting for this to disappear. Lois, you can go ahead and start the program. Oh, Lois, would you mind unmuting yourself on the bottom left? Sorry. Are you speaking to me or Lois? I'm sorry, I'm speaking to Lois. Yes. Great, go, go ahead. Good evening, can you hear me? I can. Can everyone hear me? Yes, can you hear okay. me? Okay, yes. Let yes. me start again. Good evening, welcome to the Hunter Center for Writing and Culture. My name is Louis Kremkis, I'm the director. And tonight I'd like to introduce my good friend, Barbara Taylor Bradford as our speaker. Barbara is one of the most talented and successful writers on either side of the Atlantic. British by birth and now an American citizen, Barbara was awarded the most excellent order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth II in 2007. Her debut novel, A Woman of Substance, was published in 1979 and to date has sold over 30 million copies worldwide. She has published over 35 other novels which have also become bestsellers and a number of which have been made into films starring actors such as Liam Neeson, Sir Anthony Hopkins, Deborah Carr, and James Brolin. Until recently, Barbara was married to film producer, Bob Bradford, who made several of her films. I was very fond of Bob, and I know Barbara is carrying on bravely despite her loss. Tonight, I've asked Barbara to speak to you briefly about her life in writing, and about her new book, A Man of Honor, after which she will take questions. So I hope you will all be thinking during the talk of questions for Barbara. And uh, Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lewis, and nice to see you, even though we're not in the same room. Um, actually, if I may correct you, the book I've just delivered, just finished, which is a prequel to A Woman of Substance, is my 39th novel. And the other day, my editor in London kind of pulled my leg a bit and said, but where is the 40th? When, we're, when will we get that? So soon, I'm now going to have a rest. You know, the thing that m most people say to me when they're interviewing me or if I'm at an event, uh, someone who's bought a book or is a fan is, well, when did you start writing? And they immediately think it was not long ago, but actually I started writing when I was a child. I started scribbling in school exercise books when I was seven. And when I was 10, my mother liked one of the stories and she subscribed to a children's magazine in England where they were always saying, you know, if your child is talented, does your child write poems or stories or do they do drawings? Send us contributions. So my mother liked this story, 
asked me to recopy it because there were blotches of ink and crossed out words. I did that. She sent it in. And much to her delight, as well as mine, they said they had accepted it. What was so that was wonderful, and we kept waiting to see it. And you know, several weeks went by and no story. And then came a letter saying it will be in in two weeks, and we're paying you for it. So I got a money order for seven shillings and sixpence. And you know, I think now of a story of Hemingway. He was once, um, well, not accosted, but he, a young man once came up to him at event and said, Mr. Hemingway, I just want to tell you, I am a writer, just like you. So Hemingway said, well, that's nice to know. Who's your publisher, young man? And he said, oh, I don't have a publisher yet. So Hemingway went, you can't call yourself a writer until you've been paid. And I was paid at the age of 10 for a short story, and I've been paid ever since. And I've written many, many books, as you know, but I was for years a journalist, which was the only way I could see my way. As my mother said to me when I told her I wanted to be a novelist and write books and write fiction, she said, Barbara, Barbara, you have to live life a little bit before you can do that. So she said, why don't you think of getting a job on a newspaper or a magazine? I followed her advice and worked on the Yorkshire Evening Post for a number of years, first in the typist room, and then I got moved to the reporter's room. And there was a moment in time when I was about 16 or 17, when I was the only young woman in England working in a newsroom with a lot of men. Usually women weren't accepted as reporters long ago, they are now. So from there, I went to London and worked on various newspapers and magazines and married an American, Robert Bradford, who I met there and came to live in America. I have dual nationality. I, I'm still British, and I, but now I'm American. Two passports, in other words. Um, but it was Bob one day who said to me, you've always been itching to write a novel. Why don't you try and do it now? And that, that was here in New York, not far away from where I live now on Park Avenue. So I started a novel and didn't like it and stopped. And I did that three times. And then I thought, I'm, what I'm trying to do is write a mystery story. And maybe that's not for me. So I decided to interview myself and I recommend this to anybody who wants to be a novelist. Sit down with a yellow pad and a pen and ask yourselves, you don't have to talk aloud, but you can think in your head as I did. What kind of novel do I want to write? Where do I want to set it? Who would be the key character, the protagonist? So I asked myself all these questions and wrote down the answer. And when I got to the bottom, I thought, yes, I want to write a book about a woman who does things like goes into business and has becomes a tycoon when women were not doing that in the early 1900s. And then I thought, Yes, I want to write about a woman of substance. And I looked at that name that I put there and I said, that's going to be the title. And it was. And over two years, I took two years to write a woman of substance. I um, had actually part way through a friend of mine had shown the outline I'd done for myself to an editor at Doubleday who immediately said to my friend, I want to meet this author because I love this outline. And that's how I got my first contract through a friend with Doubleday, who did indeed, Doubleday US published A Woman of Substance in 1979, which I had started in 
uh, it took me two years. In 1976, because in those days, it took about a year before a book came out. And guess what? It was a bestseller. More to my surprise, I think, than my editor at the time, who had always said, Barbara, this, this is going to be a bestseller. And I didn't believe her, but it was. And that was the beginning of my career. I was very lucky to have a first book that stayed on the bestseller list, in, on the New York Times bestseller list for um, 53 weeks as a hardcover, became a bestseller in paperback. Um, by this time I had an agent who sold it all over the world. And of course it was snapped up by the British immediately. And you know what? I still have my same publisher in England, Harper Collins, who published A Woman of Substance and my 38 other books. I've moved around a bit here in America. I have different publishers. Now I'm with St. Martin's Press and they, as well as the British, will bring out my new book in November, uh, around the 15th. And um, it is a prequel to A Woman of Substance. What I thought of was Blackie O'Neill. I was going through a really difficult period after my husband died suddenly and unexpectedly in 2019. And I realized I would have great difficulty writing the third book in a series I'd started called The Falconers, The House of Falconer. I'd done two books, uh, Master, of His, Master of His Fate and the other one in The Lion's Den. And the third one was going to be called, well, it will be now, was going to be called and will be called That Falconer Woman. But I realized that with Bob's death, I, I really wasn't capable of doing the kind of research and getting into a book like that at that moment in time. So I thought, I wish I could write a book about Emma Hart. That would be very easy for me to do. But I couldn't think of another book about Emma because I've written so much about her. So instead, I decided I would try and write a book about her sidekick, if you, her wingman, if you like, Blackie O'Neill, who is in a woman of substance for the whole time. But we always stay with Emma at the end of a day or the end of an afternoon or the end of an evening, Blackie waves goodbye and goes off and we stay with Emma. So I thought, where did Blackie go? And yes, we knew he had a wife. Yes, we know she died in childbirth during the First World War. Yes, that child was brought up by Emma. Then there was a, uh, he grew up, Brian grew up. Blackie had suddenly a grandson called Shane. We knew the edges of his story, but we didn't really know him. Although the amazing thing is he actually is considered to be everybody's favorite male in any of my books. Um, you know, Bob made 10 of my movies and in A Woman of Substance, Blackie O'Neill was played by Liam Neeson. And so I thought to myself that day in 2019, well, I could write a book about Blackie, a prequel. So I told both my editors here and in London and they said, can we have it tomorrow, Barbara? Don't worry about the one in the series, the Falconer series. We want the prequel. So you know what? I wish I hadn't thought of it, Lewis, <laughs> really, because it was one of the hardest books I've ever had to write. Because I couldn't go into A Woman of Substance, because then I would be rewriting a book that's been a big bestseller around the world. Um, so I, I was all right with Blackie's life story from the age of 13, when I got him from Ireland to England to Leeds, got him settled with his uncle, got him a job with his uncle, told all those early years. And when he got to be 17, I called my editor and I said, 
I feel as if I'm writing a young adult novel. What do I, where do I go now? It's 17 years old and we need some more grown up stuff in this book. And I suggested to her that I introduce another family, a family that is mentioned oddly enough all the way through. And I seized on this family who were the people at the big house in Ireland who kind of were kind to him when he was a child. Uh, but they had a home in England, in Yorkshire, where he was. And she said, go ahead, Barbara, I think we need some sort of balance here where you can introduce some new people. He can come in and out, but you can then tell their story and they're grown up so they can have uh, sexual relationships. They can have, have quarrels. They can live in a different way than he's used to because they're rich. Um, and we need, I think you're right, the book needs that. So, so that helped to solve one problem, but it was always a problem I was, tempted to go into a woman of substance so many times, but I took a little bit here and there. And of course, when it got to Emma, him meeting Emma Hart on the moors, as he did, I really did ha have to use some of a woman of substance because I'd already told the story. So I couldn't change it. I couldn't have them meet in a city they had to meet on the moors. So I used the dialogue in a different way and I changed it a little bit. And somehow the book did get finished, <laughs> but I've only just finished it. Um, it went last, oh, last Thursday. So a week tomorrow, it the whole book edited, fully edited by then, went to London uh, by DHL. So they have it and they will, they have it here, but it was the hardest book I've had to write, simply because I was controlled by a woman of substance, by that story. And yet I couldn't really use that story because then I was plagiarizing myself. So having started as a child writing, um, I think the marvelous thing for me is that I knew what I wanted to do when I was very young, a child. And I think if you look at actors and uh, directors and painters and creative people, those who are most successful are the ones who have always known from childhood what they wanted to do. Um, I think what I've achieved actually has surprised me that I've been, been so prolific. And questions that, you know, people come to me and say, I want to be a writer like you um, because I want to be famous and make a lot of money. And I say, but that is the wrong motivation. You have to be, you, if you want to be a writer, it must be because you want to write the book. And that's how you become a success, wanting to do something with great passion and hopefully having the talent to do it. How do I, am I finished? So I don't know if I've spoken enough. Uh, Lewis, do you wish to have the questions now? Claudette? Hi, Louis, you can unmute yourself and then we can transition into Q&A. Uh, have I given you enough now? I definitely think so. Um, and I, I, I've got some actual, I've got personally some questions for you and we've got some questions from the audience. So. How many? Five or yeah. five, one, five. I've only spoken for two minutes. Hi, we can hear you, Louis. All right. But I, I think I've said what I have to say. So do you want to start asking the questions? Definitely. Give me one. Let's see if Lewis gets reconnected <laughs> and we can move on to Q&A. Um, we've got our first question 
Lewis, we're going to move on to Q&A. And I think you can hear us. So our first question from the audience from Joan is how do you pick your themes? How do I pick my themes? Well, I really don't pick a theme. I pick a person because I'm writing a book about people. And I think the character of the character, in other words, the inner workings of Hello. the person who is going to be the protagonist, let's say Emma Hart, let's use uh, her because everybody knows who she was. A Woman of Substance came about, as I've told you, because of asking myself questions. But once I'd done that, I had to think of who is the protagonist. Character is plot. In other words, what you are as a woman or a man, what your character is, what especially your character, what your personality is, what your motivations are, all of those things come together to tell you what your life is going to be because you're going to follow all of those feelings and emotions that you have and lead your life. So that's the first thing I think about is who is the protagonist and what is that person like? And I then build the character and personality of the protagonist because the, her life and the way she wants to live it is going to be the story. So I don't have a theme, I have a person, always. Makes sense, great. Lewis, um, you can unmute yourself, you're still muted. So if you wanna jump in into any of these, feel free. The next question is from Ruth and she says, in The Lion's Den is my first foray into your novels. I sure have missed out. There are so many people in the story, which seems to me unnecessary to the story. Are you introducing them here because they will reappear in other novels in the series? Well, most of the, first of all, I don't think they're unnecessary because they have a role to play. And some of them came from Master of His Fate. This is a series of three. You should really read Master of His Fate and then in the lion's den which is a continuation of that book with characters from that book and then of course they come into in a in the lion's den and they will be will con some of them will continue in the third book which i'm going to start writing this fall but um the the person who, who just asked the question has actually <laughs> started at the end. If, if you really want to read yeah. Barbara Taylor Bradford, you can get all my books are still in print. They're all on sale. And there's everything from series like The Raven Scar Dynasty is a book of three, uh, three books. It's a series. Then I've got one of books like Letter from a Stranger, Three Days in Paris, Three Weeks in Paris. Um, but I always have a lot of characters, you know, because you need mm -hmm. those characters because that's what a novel is about, relationships between people. Definitely. We have um, a question from Jacqueline. She wants to ask you, will you please talk about your writing process? Well, once I've thought of a person and created a plot line because that's the storyline of the protagonist, I have to, for myself, I have to write an outline and tell myself the story that's in my head. I've got to write it down. You can't build a house without architectural plans. And so you can't write, I can't write a novel without an outline. I think most, readers, most writers who say, oh, I just sit down and write it. Um, I don't believe that at all. Because if the book is going to work, it must have a be middle, a beginning, a middle, and an end. It must have a purpose. What are you striving to tell? And that's where maybe a theme comes in there. What are you trying to show? You're telling the story of people's lives and relationships and how we all influence each other in relationships. And I have to know how it's going to end. I, I just can't begin it. And I have to have a title. I, I can't begin a book without a title, without the protagonist, and without 
that whole storyline in an outline. That is so impressive that you come with a title in the very beginning. Um, so audience, feel free to leave more questions. Um, I personally want to know, um, since the pandemic has occurred, how has that kind of shifted your process, your um, the way that you write, the way that you come up with stories, the way you edit? It hasn't. Mm -hmm. I've ignored it because I've always, for 40 years, I've written books at home. So mm -hmm. it's not um, a burden for me to work at home. I have a library in my apartment, which I, is full of other books as well as mine. And I go to work every day to be able to write at home, as I have done for a long time, you've got to be very disciplined. You've got to go to work in the morning and you've got to keep your own office hours. I usually start at around nine and stop about one and have a salad, then go straight back to work until about five o'clock. And I start again the next day. So it hasn't really affected me in that sense because I'm used to it, you know, I'm used to being at home working. And people who go to an office, of course, have found it very difficult. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, and then- Barbara, can you hear me? Yes, now I can see you too. You can see me and hear me. Tell me, who are some of the authors you most admired when you were younger? and who might have inspired you to write? Well, my mother was a, a very voracious reader. And when I was four years old, she taught me to read. And when I was five years old, I could have a library card at the local library. But as I got a bit older, let's say 10, 11, she introduced me to the classics, first to Dickens, and then to the Brontes who came from Yorkshire, you know, Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre, uh, two of the books by the Bronte sisters. Um, the English- Yes, they classic, were best-selling authors. Yes, the English classic, classical writers have been my inspiration, especially Dickens and the Brontes and um, Thomas Hardy. Uh, not any modern writers actually, um, when I was growing up, you know, up into my teens, I was still reading Dickens and, you know, my favorite book is David Copperfield. Um, later, I was attracted to reading books that I didn't want to write. And that were the, that is still spy books, uh, thrillers, mysteries. And I stayed away from the traditional novel, which I write because I didn't want to pick up and ha have echoes of other writers in my work. We have another Barbara. question from Joan, if I may cut in. Yes. Great, so Joan, Joan wants to know, how do you keep your characters vibrant? How do I? Well, I think a lot of that comes from an understanding of the fact that when you're writing fiction and you're writing a novel, you have to have dialogue. And dialogue has to move the plot. It can't be the kind of conversation, if you taped a conversation you might have with a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a husband, whomever, it's full of ums and errs and, you know, unfinished sentences. Mm -hmm. I have to work very hard when I do dialogue, write dialogue. And because I have to tell whoever's speaking has to move that story further along and it has to engage the reader. So it's gotta be something new. And I think it's my dialogue that does give a certain vividness to the characters. Also the things they decide to do can make a character interesting if they're daring or reckless or mean or cruel or murderous, all of the characteristics you give each person in the book, character in the book, all of those things, it's, uh, it's not an easy job. When people come and say to me, oh, I'm going to be a novelist and uh, I shall show you my book in a few weeks. And I think not a few weeks, probably a few months or maybe even a year. 
it, I do a lot of rewriting myself. I do a lot of editing and it's tough. It's not easy to make it work. Great, you know, thank it's, you. Uh, <laughs> you're a, a marvelous talk speaker as well as a writer. And, and your next book is, you have a book coming out in November, do you not? Yes, I do. I would like you to come back in November and join us once again and speak. Would you be willing to do that? Yes, yes, I would, Lewis, but I think that I will be in England um, somewhere from the end of October because they need me for about a week before the book comes out and I need to be there a few days to get over jet lag. So it would be when I get back. It would have okay, to be then we will back. we will arrange that, right, Claudette, for some yes. time when you get back. I would like you to speak again, and I wanted to thank you for such a, a wonderful presentation tonight. I think well, anyone listening you. who wants to be a writer would have uh, learned a great deal, and I, I, hope I so. thank you both. Thank you very much, Lewis. Pleasure. Thank you. What do we do now? That's hilarious. <laughs> that is so funny.